Let's let's let all the people listen to this very closely. Originally, our party was what uh, was called the Black Panther Party for self-defense. Uh, the name for a long, long time we struggled. For a long, long time, for a long, long time we struggled. For a long, long time we struggled. Good evening. My name is Lisa Moore, and I am a senior lecturer and director of the master's program in social work policy and practice at the Crown Family School of Social Work Policy and Practice at the University of Chicago. Before I continue with the introduction, I want to bring your attention to the, our ASL interpreters. We have two ASL interpreters for this evening, Shantae Frazier and Nicole Schamberger. Please use the speaker view option in order to access the ASL interpreters for this program. Welcome to tonight's special event, Black Radical Pedagogy in Chicago. This is the second of, a virtual, of virtual programs focusing on themes of Black Radical Pedagogy curated by Dr. Um, Emily Hooper Lansana and Tracy A. Matthews to accompany the exhibition, Carry May Weems, A Land of Broken Dreams, which is an initiative of Toward Common Cause, Art, Social Change, and the MacArthur Fellows Program at 40, on view now through December 12th at the Riva and David Logan Center for the Arts. I would also like to thank our co-presenters before we begin the program. The Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture at the University of Chicago, especially Beth Awano, Tierra, uh, Tierra Kilpatrick, and Tracy Matthews. The Logan Center Community Arts, especially Emily Hooper Lansana. Logan Center Exhibitions, especially Elisa, Elisa Brubaker. And finally, the Riva and David Logan Center for the Arts, especially Lee, Lee Fagan. The videos playing at the opening of the program were produced by Bob Studio for the exhibition, Carrie Mae Weems, A Land of Broken Dreams. A quick overview of tonight's program. We will hear presentations from each panelist. Then I, Lisa Moore, the moderator, will ask a few questions, then we will take audience questions. Please feel free to put your questions in the chat and we will try to get to as many of them as we can. Please note that tonight's meeting will be recorded. I'm now going to read the bios of our esteemed panelists. Um, I'm going to do it very briefly so that way we can get to the content. If you would like to review their full bios, you can review them on the program page for this evening's event. Mary Scott Boria, a lifelong resident of Chicago, arrived here at age 15 and immediately became immersed in the Chicago freedom movement as a young activist. After graduating from high school, she joined the Black Panther Party, later working with the Puerto Rican Socialist Party, the Committee to End Sterilization Abuse, and several other social justice causes. Mary Scott Boria is a graduate of Jane Addams Graduate School of Social Work at the University of Illinois Chicago and the McCormick Theological Seminary, and has over 50 years of experience and knowledge of Chicago's communities. Most recently, she directed the Urban Studies Program at the Associated Colleges of the Midwest, 
where undergraduate students from across the US and abroad spend summers learning about social justice issues in urban, urban communities. Our second panelist, Dr. Carol Lee, who's Professor Emeritus um, and the former Edwina S. Terry Professor of Education in the School of Education and Social Policy and in African American Studies at Northwestern University in Evanston, Illinois. She is the founder of four African-centered schools and institutions, including three Betty Shabazz International Charter Schools established in 1988, where she serves as a chair of the board of directors. And then we have Dio Harris, who is the principal of Village Leadership Academy, an independent private K through eight social justice school in Chicago that places an emphasis on liberatory education and transformative learning experiences through its social justice curriculum its grassroots campaign projects and its World Scholars Program. Harris received her master's in education and curriculum and instruction from the University of Illinois Chicago and her BA from Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts. And finally, Jacqueline Hamilton. She lives her work. She blends theory and practice to address the social and institutional impact of power and oppression on our physical, emotional and political bodies. Her work prioritizes the intersections where politics, policy, identity, and institutions meet. She's a proud daughter of Chicago's West Side. She carries the lessons and values her community has taught her as she travels to teach and learn about African diaspora technologies and traditions. And now I'd like to hand over the panel to um, Dr. Carol Lee. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'd like to start by thanking uh, Emily uh, and Tracy for pulling this program together. <clears throat> so I'm here uh, at, in part to represent um, what is roughly a, a 50 year history of building independent African centered institutions here in Chicago. Um, in 1967, my husband, Haki Armada Budi, founded Third World Press, the oldest uh, <clears throat> continuously publishing, trying to get my time together here, <laughs> a black publishing company, com company in the country, if not the world. In 1969, the Institute of Positive Education. <clears throat> in 1972, New Concept School. And in 1998, the Betty Shabazz International Charter Schools. And all of these institutions continue to, um, to, to thrive. Uh, on the south side of Chicago. And I might add, I'm a west side girl too, graduated Crane High School a long time ago. So I think I'd like to start by trying to place what we've tried to do over these last 50 years in a historical perspective. The title of this symposium, sort of black radical pedagogy, I would suggest that what we are talking about is not radical and that it is a normal, if you will. Um, the um, James Anderson, the Dean of the School of Education uh, at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign has written a powerful book called The Education of Blacks in the South, 19, um, 1865 to 1925, I think 1935. But one of the things he documents is that at the end of the Civil War, the very first institutions that black people founded post-slavery were schools over uh, 2000, uh, schools that were either what we would think of as independent schools or church related schools. There's a long history uh, in this country of uh, people of African descent organizing educational institutions to provide for holistic support and development of our children rooted in a deep understanding of our history. I always talk about this as a long distance run in which each generation uh, contributes to the forward flow of the community and passes the baton on to the next generation. We see the work that we've been doing here in Chicago as sort of taking up the baton, if you will, of Mary McLeod Bethune and then later Fannie Lou Hamer and Septima Clark, and hopefully in the institutions we've built to pass it, it on to the next generation that we have directly attempted to, to, to uh, prepare. I'd also like to draw uh, attention to uh, at least two books that have uh, done a great job of documenting both the history of our institutions, but others uh, in Chicago. It's a book by Worth Camille Hayes called Schools of Our Own, Chicago's Golden Age of Black Private Education, and Elizabeth Todd Breland's book of Political uh, Education, Black Politics and Education on Reform in Chicago since the 1960s. 
we have rooted the work that we have done in the proposition that if we are to understand, if we think about um, people of African descent in this country coming here under conditions of enslavement, what many of us call the Holocaust, the African Holocaust of enslavement, living under conditions that we really cannot even imagine, but who never internalize um, the uh, conceptions that others had of them as being less than human. Their humanity was never in question. Many of you may know that the um, uh, and that the burial that uh, Wall Street in New York was originally an African burial ground in the 16, 1700s, and Africans um, buried their dead in in Wall Street. The Schomburg Center for Black Culture back in the 90s worked very hard. Our daughter was involved in that work to get this uh, uh, area recognized as sacred ground, and they built a powerful monument. Um, among the things that they did was to work with archaeologists from Howard University to unearth um, remains. They found people in very ill health, which one could expect, but they also found that people were buried with ambulance, with markings on the body and in positions that said, I'm Yoruba, I'm Akan, I'm Igbo, with an expectation that we would find their bodies and recognize that they understood. So we've seen in the work that we've done over the last 50 years, the importance of helping each new generation to understand that history with the understanding that whatever they knew and believed and the kinds of relationships that they built and support that they built internally that allowed them to get up each day, put one foot in front of the next involves knowledge and belief systems that uh, need to be passed on across generations. We in our schools, New Concept School, which is an early childhood program uh, in operation since 1972, the Betty Shabazz International Charter Schools uh, in operation since 1998. We serve over 600 children a day in grades uh, 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 K through eight. Focus on the holistic development of our children to develop a strong sense of identity uh, as persons of African uh, descent and as, uh, as individuals an understanding of the importance of ethical and moral development. We stress the concept from the ancient comedic tradition of ma'at, the idea that we are all um, have inherent uh, on, uh, possibilities of development that the divine is in within uh, each of us. Uh, a focus on health in terms of we serve a vegetarian menu, which we've got national recognition for. Uh, uh, stressing a work in the arts, an understanding of history and civic engagement. We have developed over these 20 some odd years through Betty Shabazz and New Concept, literally thousands of young people who are now adults out in the world who see themselves as citizens of the world doing very, very powerful work. Um, there are many lessons, which I think in answering uh, the questions that we're gonna get later, that I'll try to address about the lessons that we've learned about what it is entailed in sustaining these institutions um, and understanding their impact in how they are you know, historically situated. I'm about out of time, but I would say one that we began this work at a time in parallel with the work that the Black Panther Party was doing. It represented, the Black Panther Party represented one, um, uh, sort of theory uh, of change, and we represent it's a similar but different sort of theory of change, you know, for our people. Uh, but I would say the big takeaway, both looking at certainly the history of the Black Panthers and the way the points that they, the 10 point program, uh, you know, it could be posted uh, today in terms of its relevance. Uh, and the work that we've tried to do is, tr is understanding that we have always had to work on parallel tracks. We work both internally within our community to build our own institutions to support our children and to support the needs that we have, while simultaneously we work externally to, to um, help to transform the nation to be able to live up to its uh, intended original goals. So with that, thank you, and I look forward to discussion further. I'll pass this baton now on to Mary. Thank you, Dr. Lee. I just have to say that as a young woman, I used to travel to the South Side 
to the Institute of Positive Education and learned a whole lot from one of your institutions. I'm really glad to be here, but I'm a little nervous to be on a panel with such giants um, and in the room with the Zoom audience, um, but I'm very appreciative of the space. However difficult it may be to accept what happens to us, one must understand that moments such as this gives us the possibility for radical change. That is Apollo Coelho, can't say his name. That is true both as individuals and as people groups who experience oppression. As a young 17 year old unwed mother in 1968, my hopes for college seemed dim to say nothing of my expulsion in my senior year from high school. Having none of it, my determined mother was sure to find me an alternative. Lucky for me, it was the first year of the school for pregnant teenagers on the west side of Chicago. My mother was a fighter having brought us to Chicago on the heels of Emmett Till's murder. Visiting Emmett's family in, in the community of Argo Summit, just to the southwest of us. Well, she herself was quite a silent warrior. Little did I know then how those little acts of fire in her would fuel my own life to this day. <laughs> well, university was out of the picture at that time, college was not. And that trajectory shaped the way I saw the world, engaged my spirit, and has influenced me ever since. I ended up at Crane Junior College on the west side of Chicago. Dr. Lee, I think this is a west side panel. <laughs> I ended up at Crane Junior College on the west side of Chicago at the exact right time, 1968, that radical change was happening. And little did I realize that religiously speaking, the waters would part my very first semester there. I was a very studious young woman. Sorry. I was a very studious young woman, but dare to say, um, I didn't think I was going to get an education like I did. Crane Junior College was Chicago's first junior college in the city, but dare to say it was perhaps its most neglected of the schools in the city's network. It was unclear how many students were at Crane in 1968, but if our accommodations were any indication, we were small in number and limited in educational resources or respect for that matter. We were working class kids from the poor west side of Chicago. The student lounge on the second floor pretty much fit the student body. And for the most part, we were kept in that corner of the whole school, of the school of Crane High School. We were housed in, in the high school. But it proved to be the place where the seeds of our black radical imagination began to flourish. Quite a host of characters found, home in that, found a home in that lounge from Morris Wright, from Maurice White and others who would soon become Earth, Wind and Fire, to Fred Hampton, the newly minted leader of the Illinois chapter of the Black Panther Party and others. I don't believe Chairman Fred was a student there as, but he visited several of the colleges, but his, his influence at Crane fermented a Black Power movement that changed the terrain of activism in the city. I could not have been in a better place. I don't think any university or college could match the experience I had at Crane. Black Panthers, sorry, I keep losing my finger here. Black Panthers, Black nationalists and other student activists, sometimes the same and often philosophically in different camps were not so often simpatico, even though they believed and fought for a radical change both in the way our minds and our lives were being shaped in the school and throughout the community. Some seeds of this had been planted in me as a young teenager growing up in Michigan, but my experience at the then Crane College exposed me to folks who to this day have served as my teachers, mentors, friends, colleagues, and comrades. Certainly folks like Fred Hampton, 
but also civil rights and anti-police brutality activist, attorney Stan Willis, who led the fight to change the college name from Crane to Malcolm X just four short years after Malcolm's death. My other teachers like Harold Rogers of the Black Trade Unionists, Alice Palmer, teacher activist who went on to become an Illinois Senator, Bob Rhodes who organized the community and taught us African American history, and Marx and Lenin, to my little but to my little but dynamic math teacher, B. Lumpkin, who served not only as role model to black young activists, but continues to this day to teach and model what radical education looks like at her ripe old age of 103. Maybe some of you who are out in the streets will see her out there. She's, she's, she's very agile. I was also to encounter Prexy Nesbitt who opened my world to international struggles and particularly South Africa. I also spent, sorry, I also spent many of those days trekking down to the South side to the Institute of Positive Education. We're engaging in deep contemporary conversations with interesting and active folk was an important side of learning. Over the years, those opportunity expanded and included lots of folks. This foundation gave me the knowledge, the understanding of context, the affirming self-awareness, the language and the courage within my own West Side context to join the Illinois Black Panther Party, which cemented my desire and taught me a whole lot about the discipline of putting that theory into action in my community and to link those actions beyond the West Side of Chicago and the US and later to think and act on the understanding that to be agents of revolutionary change is important to teach and learn from those and from others like us who experience racial, gender, class, and other forms of oppression from our schools, our communities, and the racist institutions that wanted to keep us ignorant, powerless, poor materially, and in spirit. It was a time much like now where the stakes were high and the opportunities to raise that consciousness could not be greater. As I strolled up and down the streets of the West Side with my little baby in tow, selling Black Panther papers and engaging the people I met on the streets and in the breakfast program, I soon came to know that whatever I was to do with my life, being in this context gave me so much more confidence and agency to be that agent of change in my personal and professional life, more often one and the same. I have been blessed to bring my children and now my grandchildren along. Black radical pedagogy is more necessary in this time more than ever as the contradictions within our society and in so many other places are more heightened now as never before. But dare I say we've been here before? Each generation gives us new ways new language, new languages, and new ways to act. And I'm, and I'm reminded of a quote that makes me think about what needs to be done. Dr. Jose Lopez's um, repeated quote reminds me when feeling cynical and discouraged, history does not repeat itself. It only de demands to be reconciled. I strongly believe we must learn from history but act in the now. And if we can't e easily teach our history in the institutions in our community, we'll have to step up that education in the streets. I'd say we have to equip wherever we land our feet and broaden that circle of friends, allies, and converts in each generation. Thank you. Uh, I am going to pass this on to Jacqueline. Thank you. Um, so I want to change things up a little bit. If you are in a place where you feel comfortable, um, your feet can be on the ground, your back can be a little bit straight, um, and you can dim your eyes a bit or close them if it's safe. Um, just take a moment to be in your body and take a deep breath in through your nose. And exhale through your mouth.
another breath in through your nose. And exhale through your mouth. And one more deep breath in. And exhale. And before you open your eyes, I want you to just notice how you're feeling in your body. Notice where you feel free and where you feel tight. And you can bring your awareness back into the room. Open your eyes as you feel comfortable. So for me, my role at Chicago Freedom School um, I like to say it is to help us figure out how we live our politics. And as we figure out how we live our politics, one of the main um, tenets for me is to figure out how we are living in our own bodies. One of the most radical and revolutionary things, in my opinion, that Black people can do is to be in our bodies and ourselves um, and to know what it means to own ourselves um, in, in uh, in very intimate ways, not just in a, in a philosophical or ideological way, but to know and to feel that in your own, in your own body. Um, I had some of the, the same uh, reactions as Dr. Uh, Lee to the, word, to the word radical, right? Like are, are Black needs radical or are they just radical because they're coming out of Black mouths? Um, and uh, it led me to look up the the definition of the word radical. And the definition of the word radical is really just like relating to um, or affecting the fundamental nature of a thing. Um, so for me, what radical pedagogy is, is the fundamental nature of what it means to be in, um, be in full um, power as a black person. When I think about radical uh, Black pedagogy, I, I automatically um, think, about in the way, think about the ways that I feel my own self powerful and the ways that I, the ways that I see power um, in, my, in my relationships and my community and the like. And so for me, what I decided to do is I decided to just sort of think through some of those sayings that, um, that makes sense for me, those sayings that come from my family, come from my community, uh, come from my friends, um, and, and to connect those to, to, to what we see as radical ideologies, right? Those ideologies that are all about um, addressing the fundamental nature of Blackness and the fundamental nature of, um, of what it means to be a free Black person in this world. Um, so for me, uh, one of my favorite sayings is wherever you go, there you are. And that means a bunch of different things to a bunch of different people. Um, but one of the primary meanings for me is wherever you go, there you are, you are with you all the time. So what does it mean for you to be in your center? A radical black um, a way of being is to make sure that when you think a person, you think of, you're thinking of a black person or you're thinking of your own person. When you're thinking of, uh, when you are thinking of what it means to uh, what it means to accommodate a person, you are not um, you're you're not putting yourself and your and your black self last. It's it's, it's not a uh, um, an add on to uh, to accommodate uh, black folks. That you're accommodating black folks. Um, you're accommodating your black self first. So what does it mean to center ourselves, even as we center? Uh, as we, as we push towards justice and liberation, right? What does it mean for us to constantly be putting ourselves in, uh, in the middle of that um, and loving ourselves in that, in that way? Um, also, wherever you go, uh, there you are. It's also, a con for me, a connection between um, other Black folks because wherever I go, I'm also seeing myself and other Black people all over, um, all over the world. I see myself in Black folks uh, in, in the way that we, um, in the way that we are with one another, in the ways, um, in the ways that we think, in the ways that we move, in the ways that we talk. Um, so wherever I am, I know 
um, I know that there is uh, that there is a connection between me and other Black people who are there um, as well. And that sometimes is a, is a connection that is, it is not something that is easy to articulate, but it's also one of those things that you can, that you can feel when you, are, when you are present in your own body and your own self. Um, um, every future got a past is another one of my favorite ones, right? So at CFS, we are rooted in um, the Mississippi Freedom School, uh, Mississippi Freedom Summer, right? And the Freedom Schools of, uh, of, uh, of, of the freedom uh, summer movement, right? So for, um, for our work, a lot of it is remembering that in order for us to move forward, in order of, for us to, to have sort of radical black futures, we are building those radical black futures based on, um, based on radical black pasts and based on the radical black present. So every future, um, requires us to know, to honor, to build on, um, to sharpen what has already happened. So we're using all pieces uh, of, of our experience here. Um, and I would say the last, uh, the last piece, I'm looking at my time right now. <laughs> um, uh, the, the last piece is making sure that um, making sure that, that whatever the radical right to live looks like, we are making sure that, all, that, that there is enough for all of us. So a saying in my family is some, when somebody slaughtered a hog, everybody got some, that there's enough room for everyone at the table. There's enough food for everybody to eat. And there's enough, um, that there is always enough for all of us um, in, in the ways that we are uh, building community and building our, our identities as Black folks. All right, so it looks like that is my time. I uh, want to say thank you all for listening, and I'll pass it over to Diana. All right, um, good evening, everyone. Um, first, I would like to thank uh, Emily and Tracy uh, for the invitation to participate uh, in this on this uh, esteemed panel this evening. Um, I definitely stand on the shoulders of Dr. Lee, Mama Safisha, uh, and Mary uh, as well. Mama Mary, I, I certainly uh, respect and appreciate your work. Uh, and I hope that what we're doing at Village Leadership Academy uh, makes you proud uh, and um, you know, continues the tradition. Um, so we've been asked to think about uh, Black radical pedagogy and how it relates to our work in Chicago. And so um, I am the principal of Village Leadership Academy. Uh, we are an independent, uh, private, uh, K through eighth social justice school. Uh, and so um, I've been grappling with this question uh, for the last week and a half. And um, most recently, um, I had the opportunity to, um, uh, to, it was a webinar, I attended a webinar that Dr. Jarvis R. Givens uh, presented on his new book called uh, Fugitive Pedagogy. Carter G. Woodson in the Art of Black Teaching, right? Um, and in, in his talk, he spoke a lot about insurgent intellectual networks. He talked about uh, fugitive pedagogy, right? Uh, he uh, discussed Black intellectual traditions or Black radical intellectual traditions, right? Uh, and that, as, as Dr. Lee mentioned earlier, this is not new for us, right? That after uh, emancipation, one of the first things that we did as community was build schools, right? And so, um, I'm also paying attention to what our panelists have said this evening about whether uh, what we're doing is radical or not. Um, and I have mixed feelings around that. Um, I agree in that and there are points where I disagree and hopefully we'll be able to talk about that a little bit later. Um, so I've been thinking about what I learned uh, from that webinar, from that discussion. Uh, and then uh, today as I was doing some additional preparation, um, I came across a, a quote uh, from, James, from, from James Waldwin. And it says, um, education, or he said, education is a synonym for indoctrination if you are white and subjugation if you are black. And so his quote, uh, and thinking about Dr. Givens' work, work as well, and what we do here at VLA, um, I have a lot of questions, right? Um, I think we do, um, well, I'll get to my questions later. Basically, we hold the position, right? We all know that education is not neutral, um, uh, that the process of schooling um, is, or has historically been um, concerned with uh, basically uh, legitimizing uh, and reproducing uh, dominant cultural norms, right? Uh, we also start with the premise here at VLA uh, with our students that um, we do live and operate under um, a white supremacy. Um, and, and because of that, and because of with this understanding, um, um, I was trying to center my, my thinking around uh, sort of four components, uh, curriculum, uh, schools themselves, uh, and students, 
um, maybe it's really three things like curriculum itself, uh, students, um, no schools and education. Right. And so um, I think when I think about black radical pedagogy and I'll talk for about, I don't know, about five minutes. Uh, and then and for the last two minutes, I do want to show a video. So I am uh, want to be mindful of my time as well. Um, if we start with the premise that we are living and operating under a white supremacy, uh, then curriculum does become radical. Right. Depending on what you're teaching. Right. Curriculum is a form of cultural politics. Um, and for us, we want our curriculum um, uh, to, to be culturally um, empowering and affirming. Um, we do want it to be radical because we do want our, our students to uh, resist. Uh, we do want our students to question. Uh, we do want our students to pose problems, ask questions. We want them to, be, to innovate, right? Um, and so um, we also want uh, through our work uh, to sort of make power visible and we want to make power accountable. Um, and so uh, additionally, and, and I, can, I know this is, I'm not supposed to talk about VLA itself, but obviously it's what I'm grounded in. And so, um, Schools are also sites of contestation, um, right? Uh, there are sites for construction, for constructing, producing, um, and producing uh, knowledge. Uh, and uh, it's a tool, right? Uh, and, it, and it really depends on how you're wielding that tool. And for us, uh, we want our students to understand their education to be a tool uh, that helps uh, build black institutions um, that um, reconsiders possibilities. Uh, we are not interested in our students replicating the status quo. Uh, we are interested in creating spaces um, where um, we are working collaboratively alongside our students, uh, where their voices emerge, um, um, where they help um, also inform us about radical possibilities uh, for change and for struggle. Of course, we are a school, so of course we're teaching, you know, literacy, math, and writing, and all of those things, and we teach those things a great level ahead. But what's really central and important for us uh, is something that we call our grassroots campaigns, and that's GRC. And it's through this that we want our students to be thinking very critically about social justice issues that they are experiencing and encountering in their communities. And they spend an entire year uh, researching the root cause of those issues, um, identifying influential forces. So they're learning about power structures, right? Um, they're looking to see if there are organizations uh, or individuals who are working on those problems, but ultimately they develop uh, their own action plan and implement it. Because we are an independent school, we, we do have a lot of autonomy with our curriculum uh, and who we invite into our space. Um, the space is really important, right? And so we have worked with Chicago Freedom School. Uh, we work with BYP 100. We work with the Sada's Daughters. Uh, we worked with so many of the um, organizing communities uh, in the city and invited them into our space uh, to, um, uh, to invite them to help us um, in this project that, that we're doing here, here at VLA. Uh, Mary said earlier she's nervous, so am I, so I feel like if she admitted that I can do the same. Um, and so um, when I'm thinking about Black radical pedagogy, I mean, honestly, for me, um, I want our students to shake things up. I want our students to have radical imaginations. I want them, we want them to understand that they are um, change agents now. It's not when you get to college and you take a cultural studies class, it's now, right? Um, it's dismantling or understanding or them being, knowing that they are able to dismantle systems of oppression. Um, it's us helping to give them language to it because our students, although we're K through eighth grade, they are experiencing so much, right? And the world is happening to them um, and we want, um, them to understand that they can also happen to the world, that there's still space and time and so much work to do um, uh, for all of us. And um, we, wanna, we want them to know that we stand beside them, uh, in front of them when necessary and behind them. And so um, to me, that work is radical because of the particular time and place that we're, that we're currently living in. Um, and hopefully one day, um, you know, when uh, if it, our progeny, if they're, if they're, you know, they don't have to kind of have these same conversations. Um, because as Dr. Lee said, we've been having these conversations and building these institutions for, for quite some time. For quite some time. Um, I started my clock a little bit late, so I think I am going to pause there. And um, I'm certainly interested in, in having the conversation and discussion a little bit later. But the video that I do want to show you all, um, because it's also about critical praxis for us, so we can talk about theory, we can do all the cultural empowerment, right, empowering that we want to do here and give uh, rise to student voice. Um, but we also actually want to take that extra step uh, and, and uh, commit to action. And so the video that you're going to see uh, is uh, just two minutes, uh, just the first two minutes and eight seconds um, of students um, when we uh, reclaimed MLK Day. So we did have a, um, uh, we organized in March, our students organized in March from one of our former campus sites to the Juvenile Temporary Detention Center uh, to sort of uh, highlight the school to prison pipeline and to, uh, you know, take a stand against it from a youth perspective, right? And so. Um, I will stop there. Uh, thank you again for listening. And then um, I believe it's Alyssa. You can just uh, roll the video.
Right now, we are making time for our Reclaim Memorial Day Day protest. Um, as people of color, we believe that we should reclaim who MLK was and who he still is and his legacy. And the significance of this march is we will be marching from here at, at Bellevue Leadership Academy down to the Juvenile Detention Center. And that represents like uh, the ending of the school to prison pipeline uh, where actually our fifth graders, Ms. Brown's homeroom class, um, are working on mental health and incarceration. You are education, not incarceration. We want to end the school to prison pipeline. You want to stop the criminalizing of black and brown youth, especially black and brown young men. You want to tell the government, tell the state that our lives actually matter. something that ML uh, thank you so much and I am uh, honored to turn it back over to uh, Lisa. thank you so much I learned so much from each of you and I look forward to continuing to learn um, as we engage in some discussion now and so you know a question I want to share um, or ask of, of you all, is what are the strengths and challenges of creating and leading and sustaining spaces um, that are liberatory? Well, <clears throat> we have been doing this for 50 years, so I think there are a few lessons that we have learned. Um, I think one, has to do with um, what we might think of as a theory of change. Uh, and that is to say, what <clears throat> mechanisms do we think have to be in place in order to enhance the life opportunities, in our case, of people of African descent, which has a ripple effect um, every movement that we have uh, put forward, every piece of legislation <clears throat> that we have helped bring into being uh, has over the course of the history of this country impacted others. Uh, W.E. Du Bois had argued that the development of a public school system for poor whites in the South after the Civil War was a direct outgrowth of the efforts of black people to establish our own schools and then begin to push the, the local county and, and state governments to pay for it. So this whole intersection of class and race is one that is not sufficiently, I think, addressed. Um, based on what you think are the, the underlying mechanisms that you can influence it seems to me helps to shape the kind of institutions that you're trying to establish and what you want them to do. <clears throat> I think that <clears throat> sustaining organizations over time, which is something that we haven't talked about, but we've all experienced one way or another, requires the recruitment of a wide range of expertise. I will say that, that what has allowed us to sustain ourselves with these three institutions over these 50 years has certainly been those of us who were directly committed, you know, ideologically to the work, um, who in our case had experience in educational publishing, et cetera. But also that we had as partners in that work, <clears throat> people who shared <clears throat> our ideological orientation, but also were grounded in business 
and finances and legal issues. Uh, you know, I'm sure Diary that you all have, have wrestled with this as well, that there's technical expertise that's required to sustain these institutions over time. And then in terms of leadership issues, <clears throat> I think that one of the things that's important, and I'm thinking back married to this, you know, sort of period of what Black Panthers were doing, you know what I mean, in the late 60s and what those of us in the, you know, more African-centered movement were doing, <clears throat> these sort of um, differences in points of view and differences in personality that leadership have to develop skills to be able to listen and manage difference. Many organizations have died primarily because people with difference who thought they were on the same plane but had different personalities or different issues couldn't, couldn't wrestle with them. Um, and that there are many spaces in which we can build these institutions. We can build independent institutions as we've done with the Institute of Positive Education and um, you know, new concept, what Dio's done with uh, Village Academy. Um, we made the decision in 1998 to get into the charter school business because we said it was our taxes. And therefore, if we could educate kids without having to charge tuition, that we would do that. And it was a fight. When we first went to the CPS, they told us no. And Haki, who kind of got us all into this, these various businesses, say always had failures, not an option. Anyway, we work behind the scenes politically to finally get it, but it's a fight along the way. But they've been sort of parallel places of outreach, you know, for doing the work. Um, I am. Oh, sorry. Omega. Yes, Diane. Okay, yes. sorry. Yeah. Uh, here at VLA, we say, may I speak? Um, I was about to say that. But um, yes, um, I do want to acknowledge that the co founders of Village Leadership Academy are uh, Nikisha Hobbs and Anita Andrews Hutchinson. Um, and so um, I learned a lot under their leadership um, and um, continue to learn uh, what it takes to, to really run uh, an independent uh, Black institution. Um, VLA definitely has a very unique uh, funding model, although we are uh, private and we are tuition based. Um, we um, offer very comprehensive uh, financial aid uh, and scholarships. And so I think one of the challenges uh, that I sort of perceive is, um, is I think that, you know, you, how do I want to, I want to make sure that I'm being diplomatic. When people learn about the work of VLA, uh, oftentimes they're really excited about it, right? And, and they say, this is incredible. The work that you're doing is really incredible. Uh, but at the end of the day, right, institutions um, need funding. Uh, and it's been an intentional choice uh, to remain uh, independent. Um, we certainly understand um, why an independent institution would, would become a charter institution, right? And so um, one of the challenges I think is um, wanting, or, or I'm just going to say it and be blunt, I think um, getting more uh, black people to actually uh, fund and support uh, the institution. And so um, that, that has been a challenge. And it's a question that I've, you know, if Anita and Nikisha are listening, they know that I've, that I've um, expressed frustration around that, particularly uh, around black philanthropists uh, in the city of Chicago. And I don't mean this uh, comment to be disparaging uh, by any means. I am saying that if you value and appreciate the work and you see the work that institution, independent black institutions are doing, um, that there are many ways to support them with your time. But a, a lot of times, right, uh, we also need the, the, the um, financial contribution as well. If I could just to add to Dada's comment, clearly, you know, we clearly have experienced that both the Institute and New Concept are still independent. But another area of expertise, I think that we often need are people who understand how to do that outreach, how to, how to actually connect not only with the philanthropic community, but with, with people who have resources that can be shared. I think that there are some underlying issues and competencies that as a community, we've got to figure out how to develop a kind of, I don't know, network of supports that may not be you know, isolated to any one particular institution, but to help us all figure out. I mean, if you think about historically black colleges are running up against the very same issues that you, you're talking about, uh, you know, in comparison to other institutions, comparison to Northwestern where I spent the last 30 years. So I think in the broader scheme of things, it's, it's important for us to sort of think, you know, collectively and collaboratively 
about how do we develop the range of kinds of expertise that are needed to carry out and sustain uh, institutions that we develop over time. But again, I would say that history is our inspiration. Mary McLeod Bethune sold sweet potato pies and had a vision of establishing a college, Bethune Cookman College. I mean, you can go back entirely through our, our history to see the ways in which we have been highly successful in developing institutions to sustain ourselves as a people. And that's why I said we have to work on two parallel, two parallel journeys. You think about the Black Panther and Mary, the 10 point movement. One aspect of that is what do we do for help? You know, with what you're doing, Jacqueline, what do we do in terms of housing? What do we do on all these things that we need? What do we do to keep our young kids out of gangs? You know what I mean? How do, how do, how do we recruit them where the gangs can't kind of thing on the one hand and at a parallel fashion, completely to be organized in terms of making the state at all its levels um, uh, do what it's supposed to do for people. Mm -hmm. Just want to add on. Be dependent on it. Yeah. So it was like on. Mary and then Jacqueline. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I just want to add on to sort of that piece around history because I think um, I, I'm a I'm a great fan of Dr. Carol Anderson um, from I think she's at Emory now. Um, in her book, she in her book White Rage, um, she takes us back to the time around the Civil War and then brings us up to our current moment. And we see how our movements, our, our, our advances get sabotaged. And so I think to learn, and I think uh, Dr. Lee uh, talked about to learn from history, um, we've got a, a wealth of history to learn from, but we also need to learn how our movements have been destroyed and to sort of really pay attention to the ways in which we are, we are our own saboteurs or, or the ways in which the uh, society at large uh, sabotages us. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm reminded of the Brown versus Board of Education. And after Brown versus Board of Education, even though, you know, it was an amazing uh, change in society, more African American teachers lost their jobs after Brown versus Board of Education than had been teachers before. And so we, we have to pay attention and we have to pay very close attention um, to how society shifts and what policies shift us um, and then what's in our best interest and really uh, look at when you say, so we're not radical or we're not revolutionary, we get slapped back often because we're not paying attention um, to, those, those, to that backlash. Mm -hmm. Jacqueline? I, I'd like to just add something that's going to complicate the conversation. And I know there are a lot of people who may or may not agree with me. I have argued that white supremacy as an ideology is like a spider web. And it has built into it all kinds of assumptions. And what we often don't recognize are the ways in which we get caught inside the spider web because we're always responding to something that they put out as an assumption. One of them is the construct of race. We have this whole terminology. Haki just gave me something from the New York Times. So we talk about black and brown people and there's some new acronym they have or whatever. There are no black people and there are no white people. All human beings have different degrees of melanin which manifest themselves in colors that range from a kind of light ivory to a beautiful deep chocolate brown. All the terminologies that come out of this construct of race end up positioning as quote unquote, people who are self-ascribed as white, which is a moving target. You can think about a book was published some years ago when the Irish became white, right? They set up it at Ellis Island and they said the Jews aren't white, the Italians, they ain't white, the Irish certainly ain't white. You know, it's a moving kind of target. Uh, <clears throat> and, and what it is as a, the, the, the terminology we use normalizes us, the, the normal people and the other people. And so we get, we're part of the other, other folks. But what it is, is a political construct with political aims and purposes. And we have to attack it and understand it as such. On the other hand, in terms of what we've been trying to do in terms of African-centered folks and everybody here, 
is understanding ethnicity, right? That we are peoples of African descent who have been dispersed across the world. We happen to be here in the diaspora. There's more people of African descent in Brazil than in the United States. And through that, we have inherited a set of practices and belief systems and nature of social relationships, you know, extended family, respect for elders and the like that have sustained our community over time. And the construct of race doesn't bring that in. The construct of race says you started in 1619, you know what I mean, as, as an enslaved person. So we have to have a philosophical, just getting at the challenges going from the 20s, maybe that's your next question. Mm -hmm. so from my perspective, to be truly liberated, we have to pull ourselves from the philosophical assumptions of this ideology of white supremacy and fight it as a political system but not one that has to do with our identity, that has to do with who we are and how we sustain ourselves, you know what I mean, as families and how we develop our children. Mm -hmm. Jacqueline, you're trying to get in. Yes, I have a lot to say and ask about what was just offered, but I want to go to what, so initially what I was uh, going to uh, talk about in terms of like challenges of, uh, around uh, organizations is, is just sustainability, right? A lot of what we have been thinking about and working on uh, uh, is thinking about how does this, um, how do we build institutions that are not built on the, on the specific people who are there? It is not just that it is, um, that is rooted and grounded in radical and liberatory theory because, um, because this person is there and, and if they should leave or need to leave, um, then everything falls apart. So what does sustainability and long-term um, sustainability look like and feel like? And how do you build an institution that, um, that is both protective of, um, of these radical ideologies, but is also uh, uh, flexible enough to grow into, uh, into an even more radical um, understanding uh, of, of what the world is and what's needed um, for a particular moment. Um, but yes, um, I was gonna say that, but I wanna move into the conversation that we, <laughs> that, that we just said it in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, even though I sent you all a list of questions right now, it just sort of went <coughs> there because this is so rich, right? And thinking about the significance of history and the different ways in which Black people in this country have created their own realities, whether it's Gullah folks in, in, in the South or the Black towns, we had all those different spaces. We have a history of creating our own societies and ways of being, even here in the United States that sometimes get overlooked. And so this question of sustainability educationally is really important to consider. And it does tie in around sort of like, you know, how, how has organizing evolved um, between the 20th and 21st century? And, and also, you know, as educators and activists for, for you all, you know, I think all these different ideas that are being shared are really important to think about, well, what, what's continuing to happen? What's continuing to evolve? Um, what does the future look like? And so, um, again, we can move on to this next question. We can also continue here. I know our time is rapidly passing too. Um, so, so yes. I think we've certainly broadened our context. I mean, I, I think our lens gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And I think that's a challenge. I think that's a, that's, you know, we have to broaden. We have to broaden our context. We have to win friends <laughs> and influence people, right? Mm. Um, and I think that those challenges mean that there are various ways, as Dr. Lee pointed out, there are various ways in which we look at these, uh, as we look at the world and we look at the challenges in the world. And so we have to be patient enough with each other, but also challenge, I think, enough, uh, challenge ourselves enough to understand that we have to grow um, to survive and, 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 and that we need to figure out how to do that in a way that doesn't um, submerge our issues. Um, and so, you know, I think um, 
you know, I think about, we're, we're going to have a question about technology, so I don't want to get too much in that, but I love Zoom because that means I get to participate in many more things than I would if I had to go to everything. But I think we have to figure out how to, um, you know, how to touch the masses. And I think we have to take our messages outside of our spaces, outside of our institutions, and institutions can be um, bearers of that knowledge and of that frame of those frameworks. Um, but we got to figure out how do we touch, you know, the brothers and the sisters on the corner in our neighborhoods who are connected to these institutions, who actually feel that these institutions work against them sometimes. Um, <clears throat> and so I think as we broaden our context, we have to also figure out how to engage and embrace an, an ever-growing population that feels sort of disenfranchised um, from all mm -hmm. of these, from all of this thinking, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it looked like Jacqueline was um, next, and then Dr. Lee, mm -hmm. and and we have two questions from um, from people who are watching. So Jacqueline, um, I think. Um, when we think about how organizing has uh, has evolved, I think we go back to um, to Mary's uh, earlier offering, which is learning about the ways uh, the ways that um, the forces that uh, that um, form themselves uh, against us against us um, so oppressive uh, forces are becoming more sophisticated. So learning about um, about what um, what has historically happened, but also keeping a lens on the um, keeping a lens on the ways that um, that these organizations and institutions um, that you know that mean us harm are uh, are also working because they tend to have more money, they got more people, they got more free time, right? If we go to you know go to Dr. Lee's. Um, uh, spider web. It reminds me of, uh, mm -hmm. of the Toni Morrison quote that talks about like the the thing that sort of keeps us rooted and um, and keeps us stuck is um, we're constantly having to fight off all of these uh, all of these um, attacks on our personhood. So it keeps us distracted and it keeps us from doing our work. So um, so in thinking about how organizing um, has changed. Organizing changes because it requires even more of our, uh, even more of our, our resources and our attention because it is, because it's hitting us from more, um, from more angles. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dr. Lee? I have often <clears throat> uh, put forth the idea, it was not me, it was a lot of people have talked about this, the notion of liberated zones, that if we, in terms of making what we're trying to do in some sense more tractable, if you look at, you know, say anywhere in Chicago, let's say at, I don't know, a four or five square block radius, and you identify first how many churches there are, right? How many churches, how many, you know, block clubs, et, et cetera. And if within those spaces, which I think actually needs to come from the leadership of the church because there's more black churches than any other institution in this country in black community. And say within this four square block radius, this is our liberated zone, right? And we are, we, we control it. We, we make sure that there are hands and mentors for every young person in that neighborhood if the gangs are gonna do something, they gotta go through us first, right? If the police are coming in, they gotta go through us first. It, it's, it's tractable, it's, it's doable, it sort of brings com, you know, communities uh, together. Um, and I, I, I think that it's uh, an, an important way to, you know, uh, to move. On this technology end, I would say that there's an aspect of technology that has always been at work, if you will, I can remember um, I was 10 years old when Emmett Till was, was killed and it was his picture in Jet Magazine, a technology, if you will, that brought home, you know, what had happened to this young man. 
and you you know flash forward to seeing uh, George Floyd being murdered. You know what I mean on on the video. Um, and I think that there are ways in which digital media, in particular today, offer such uh, powerful promises for how we can sort of communicate and connect both within our communities around the nation and for that matter, around the world. If you look at the impact of Black Lives Movement and the international uptake of that has been extraordinarily powerful. And then I would just conclude by saying that part of getting beyond this spider web of this ideology of white supremacy, where we're using terms like mainstream America and mainstream values and all that, there is virtually no aspect of American history or broad scale cultural practices that now have not been influenced by people of African descent. Mm -hmm. So the notion that, that you know, we gotta be included and pull us in and all that, that's part of that little spider web set of assumption because it's not true. I was in Malaysia some years ago. It happened to be during the Christmas season, going in this hotel. They're playing black music, right? So part of it too is understanding our power, understanding our power in terms of voting. If we came out in every entity where we live, and if you had 80 to 90% of black people that you could predict were gonna come out and vote, uh, there would be some listening to us. So we had these is notion of thinking about what are our, our potential levers, you know what I mean, of, of influence. You could say in this four square blocks that we own it, and that means what any election that's coming out, like we did, you know, Mary when Harold Washington was coming up, you go and you knock on every door, you pull out, everybody going to come out. The old ladies going to put their little hats on or whatever, you know, to come out. Uh, and vote that the power that we one of the issues I think is that we don't recognize the actual power mm -hmm. that we have. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if we didn't have power, none of us would be here. Right. Our ancestors imagined us, right? And we must imagine the next few generations that come and through the institutions that we build, we prepare them. When I look at the literally thousands of people over these 50 years who've come out of our schools, they are extraordinary human beings. They see themselves as citizens of the world. The idea of black inferiority is an absurd notion. They don't wrestle with it and have to beat their chest. That ain't even a question. Why would I get all tied up about that? Whoever thinks that got a problem, maybe I need to help them out, right? Mm -hmm. They're building businesses. They're out there in the world. Um, and, and we all have the capacity, you know what I mean, to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yep. I love the, uh, I would love to have Dial speak about their Frederick Douglass campaign, um, because I think that was where young people uh, showed that they had power in a, in a you know, in, a, in, a, in an amazing way. I used to live across the street from Douglas Park, so I just feel so, um, you know, delighted when I drive through there now and know what these young people have done. Mm -hmm. And Di, you may want to say something about the, the international focus. You, you have your children traveling all over the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm sure. Thank you so much. I, I can do both. Thank you. Um, um, so yeah, there's a little, well, I'll start with the World Scholars Program. Um, so we do, we want our students to understand that they are part of a larger diaspora, right? And that it is important uh, for us to be uh, in solidarity with marginalized communities all over the world. And so um, you know, as a school, we've had, I think it's 10 successful trips. Um, I've been on some, not all of them. They're not vacations by any means. Um, and so the school and, and our students, we've traveled to uh, Brazil, uh, Mexico, South Africa, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, Ghana, uh, Haiti, Costa Rica, Guatemala, Cuba, uh, Dominican Republic, and I may be forgetting a few, so forgive me. Um, but it's, it goes back to what Dr. Lee was saying. Um, we do, there's, and, and maybe it was Jacqueline actually, um, we want our students to know that there's really nowhere that you can go in the world where you're not going to encounter yourself, where you're not going to see Black people, uh, where you're not, you know, where, you can travel anywhere and make those connections that maybe some of the issues that we are experiencing on the West Side of Chicago, you know, we have the West Side is here, um, right, that, that, that maybe there are some similarities to what's happening in Soweto. Um, we want our students to make those connections now. And again, I want to remind everyone that, you know, our students are, are kindergarten through eighth grade, so they're pretty young. And um, we hope to have the same legacy as the Betty Shabazz, uh, you know, a new concept schools. Um, my, uh, you know, my, my students, my first class, uh, they're now um, sophomores in, in college. And so 
some of the stuff that you've been talking about, Dr. Lee, we're sort of seeing that with our students too, right? The ones who go on to high school and they're shaking things up in their high schools uh, and, the, and the people that they're becoming and we are, we are uh, remain very proud, you know? Um, and then uh, I think Mary did ask me to speak a little bit about the, um, the Change the Name campaign. And so um, as I mentioned earlier, we have something called the Grassroots Campaigns and really every single homeroom class uh, has to um, uh, develop an action plan and implement it. And the one that you're talking about in particular uh, was a, um, it, it almost took our students like four Four consecutive years, uh, and it started out as a question around police brutality, uh, and it spanned across two teachers, uh, Miss Jones and Miss Pagan. And essentially, the students were um, they were uh, being impacted by uh, psychologically impacted, right, by the images of black death uh, being paraded on, on on television and online and in social media. And um, it was important for uh, their teacher, Miss Jones, to give them space to speak about how they were being impacted. They wanted to do something around for the people um, uh, who were murdered uh, at the hands of, uh, you know, police and, and state, state uh, sanctioned state violence. And so um, they started out with really, I'm going to really make this very short, they really wanted to honor Rakia Boyd, uh, who was murdered uh, by an off duty police officer near Douglas Park. Uh, and through investigation and research and meeting with Alderman Michael Scott Jr., right, um, they discovered, you know, that it's pretty challenging to get a park renamed uh, after a person. And then uh, typically that person has to have had some sort of historical significance, right? And so the idea that they, they wanted to honor Rikia Boyd and rename the park initially after her. Um, the idea then evolved to say, okay, well, it's already named Douglas, uh, formerly a Stephen Douglas, right? Well, who, who can we honor, right? And then, you know, this, they're fifth graders at this time. And so they think, okay, Frederick Douglass, right? And the slogan at that time was add an S, it's for the best, right? Uh, because Frederick Douglass's name is spelled with two S's. And so um, through that, I mean, there's a lot of like community canvassing that occurs. There's a change.org petition. There's, um, uh, there are train takeovers that's happening, right? And so there's a, an, an awareness campaign. And there are many folks in the North Londale community who already assumed that Douglas Park was named after Frederick Douglass. Uh, our students also presented to the Chicago Park District Board of Commissioners multiple times. Uh, and they received, um, you know, uh, no response or silence, or they were being, you know, they were patronized as little kids. And so they continued this work alongside their teachers. And so um, eventually it, it became important to also uh, bring in Anna, right? And so uh, it took to also acknowledge uh, Anna Douglas, Anna Mary Douglas, uh, Frederick's uh, first wife, um, who was also really responsible for his, for his emancipation. Um, and so uh, long story short, through the through this prolonged struggle, right, um, the Chicago Park District Board of Commissioners uh, did um, uh, make the decision to rename Stephen Douglas Park to Anna and Frederick Douglas Park, uh, and that set uh, a citywide precedent. Uh, it's the first time that a park uh, has been renamed after a person um, that was was formerly named after a person and then renamed. And so it, we also it was a community wide effort as well. Like Chicago Freedom School was helping us. There were lots of organization, Friends of the Park, uh, lots of individuals and organizations that helped. And so it's a win for all of us, right? The um, uh, uh, Triple C, uh, the North Lawndale Coordinating Committee, I always mess up the acronym, but, you know, uh, Sheila uh, McNary was really instrumental. And so um, it's a community win as far as we're concerned. Uh, and so thank you for, for uh, bringing that up. Um, but again, for us, um, and I, I really like what you're saying, Dr. Lee, about the spider web, right? I'm sure we've all had that experience. We've been walking down the street and, oh, you know, you, you, uh, you, <laughs> you, you, uh, you, uh, you encounter a spider web that you didn't even see was there, right? But it's flimsy and it's, we, can, we can remove it. And so that, to me, we can also dismantle, right? And so um, that's what we want our students. We want them to understand it to be as simple as a flimsy uh, spider web. Thank you. So I do want to get to one of the chat questions. Um, which is, and someone wrote in, um, how do we set up a movement with homeschooling parents, liberation movements, and cooperative land-based Black radical traditions? I am wondering about our land as a strategy the long term. And so is anyone open to responding to that? So Dr. Jafunza Wright, uh, she and her husband head up the, what is it called, in Pembroke, Illinois. Um, where they they offer uh, holistic services around uh, natural foods here in the city, but that they grow, you know, on their own land. But they have a um, black oats, it's called. But they they have a significant uh, body of work for some years around things like urban gardening, for example, which is something you know we're involved in as well, you know, with our schools. Um, the homeschooling issue, there's a sister, and I just, I can't think of her name, that has, I, I believe has created a, an organization, and I think it may be a national organization, 
uh, around uh, black families and, and homeschooling. I don't know if anybody, I'm sure a search would, would pull it up, but there is, there is such an organization specifically to support black families in engaging in, in homeschooling. You know, it's interesting that during the pandemic or during the height of the pandemic, I heard about um, all of these sort of white communities that set up these learning pods um, in their communities. And, you know, and these are in small communities. And I think, you know, one of the fallouts in the black community in particular in Chicago is what, how gentrification has split and separated our communities and our families. So make it makes it really hard sort of to come together um, and to share with each other. But I think that that's kind of an interesting model. And unfortunately it was uh, available for privileged few people who were able to do that maybe in their own communities. Um, but I've always thought that, you know, our homes could, our homes are definitely places of learning. And why do we have to feel as if um, there's other expertise out there. I mean, I think that it's important to have that expertise and I honor the schools that are represented here because I think you flow out of this natural sense of the importance of families and the importance of families as educators for their, for their children. But we come from families where we can educate. I mean, we used to have these Saturday schools. Uh, you know, we used to have, used to have lots of freedom schools. Um, you know, we had places where um, parents could learn how to educate their own children. Um, and so I think, I think uh, some interesting models have to take us back to our local levels, take us back into our communities and really take us back into our homes and really model the fact that parents are the first educators of their children, that we don't have to give our children over to these institutions who don't love them. Um, you know, and we know that these big institutions don't love our children. Um, mm -hmm. and, so, um, and so, you know, you all, your schools model a certain kind of um, respect and response to the needs, uh, particularly of Black children. Um, and I think that those are models that could be shared um, in our communities and our communities could have the capacity to real. In, in uh, Logan Square, there's um, a network. It's not a homeschooling network, but there's a network of, of uh, schools in the Logan Square, Square community where they realized that a lot of the parents that were coming here, a lot of the immigrant parents that were coming here from places like Mexico um, didn't have uh, language skills, didn't have the English language skills. Um, and, but, and so therefore limited their ability to help their children learn, right? And what they decided to do in that community was to open up these parent centers as ways to sort of educate parents who then could be educators for their children. And out of that uh, model grew um, a, a program called Grow Your Own. And, and Dr. Lee, you might know about the Grow Your Own program where they're really training mothers and fathers in communities to become educators who can then go back into these institutions or in the homeschools or wherever mm -hmm. um, and educate their own. And I think, you know, we just, I feel as if we've lost the ability um, to think about schools as our intimate, as intimate um, institutions for us. They're kind of far removed and our kids are going all over the city and um, buses at five o'clock in the morning sometimes. Um, and so, you know, I think that there's the opportunity to create those networks and your schools, I mean, I'm not going to tell you how to run your schools, but I think your schools are models for, for ways in which they can reach out to these communities. Yeah, that Grow Your Own movement actually is a black woman who's one of the major uh, leaders nationally uh, in, in that program. And there's also um, the Harlem Children's Zone as one example of kind of <clears throat> a community deciding this territory is liberated space. And we, you know, support for, pa for parents, schools, et cetera, coordinated within that small 
stretch of land. It's definitely everything that you just said, Mary, is mm -hmm. definitely something that uh, we're attempting to do. So VLA is actually part of a larger network of schools called It Takes a Village Family of Schools. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we do offer, you know, uh, holistic services uh, uh, from infant, uh, you know, all, currently all the way to eighth grade into uh, certainly families. And so I do think it's, uh, you know, it's wraparound services. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's counseling. Uh, mm -hmm. It is um, early childhood education. It's employment opportunities. And so really being able to respond more immediately to the demands of our community, uh, that is the goal. Um, mm -hmm. And that is what we're, that's what we're working towards. Mm -hmm. Jacqueline? I think also uh, an important piece if we're thinking about what it means to radicalize uh, or support the radicalization of, um, of, uh, of children, I think it, particularly in, in homeschooling environments, it can be really important to, uh, to be doing that in ways that, uh, that each lesson is values-based. Um, so, uh, you know, there, there are a plethora of, um, of programs. There are Black folks who are doing specific science and liberation uh, projects. I know my nephews were doing like a Malcolm X caterpillar uh, science uh, project. Um, so there, um, you know, there, there are the Little Maroons in, um, in, uh, in Brooklyn who I, you know, know had, um, had a curriculum. Their, um, their curricula, they're all over the place. But also I think what is important is to figure out what are those radical or what are those ideologies, those principles, and how do you how do you integrate them into learning? One of the most mind blowing things that somebody said to me that I had never thought about before was uh, an abacus is not a toy, right? And um, and in in unpacking that for my own self, it helped me to think about the uh, the ways that colonization is is so pervasive in our. Um, in our understanding of what the what even the tools are, right? Like it's not a toy; it actually is a tool, and is is um, has a longstanding history. And you can use that as a way to to explore math, to explore history, to explore um, to explore culture um, as well. So, so I think that there are, that there are ways, particularly for homes homeschooling children, to um, to have more holistic models of um, of education, and then um, to work with. Um, with other uh, with other young folks um, or other families on figuring out what it means to practice those uh, those values out in the world. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I think that uh, we need to do is to create, perhaps through social media, a better way to represent how much uh, organizing is actually going on. There's really a tremendous amount that we just don't know about. It happens to be in this neighborhood or this city or whatever the case may be. And then some way for these organizations to be able to interact with one another, particularly when they have common you know, kinds of goals and, and structures. So, so we need to start wrapping up. So I'd like to hear last comments from each of you. Um, what do you hope people are leaving with um, or any words of wisdom that you'd like to share? Final words of wisdom. You've offered many. I'll just well, call I, you yeah. I hope <clears throat> I hope people one will be inspired uh, around the amount of uh, work and liberated zones, if you will, that are actually going on right here in the city of Chicago that many of us may not know about. Um, I hope that people will. Um, um, think in, in sort of, re, you know, read deeply in history to really be inspired and to understand about how much we have accomplished and how we have accomplished it, to really push against this sort of meta narrative that people of African descent and other communities are simply, you know, uh, victims as opposed to, to agents, and to really begin to conceptualize the power of what it's possible, you know, for, for us to do. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, you ask us to sort of have one word or phrase to end with. And so I, I'm going to say this because I thought about it a long time ago and I say it all the time to myself. I'm a, um, I'm a student of genealogy um, and I've discovered some wonderful things uh, about the past. And so I say you often 
don't appreciate history until you get one. Mm. And I think it's um, in schools like the two schools, the three schools actually that are represented here uh, that teach young people about themselves and in learning about themselves, they really do dig deeply into the history of themselves, their families, their communities and our society. So that would be my final word. Thank you. Um, so I think what is important about, um, about our work and about the way that we uh, move forward is, is recognizing that, um, recognizing the power in our own um, stories and, I, uh, and identities, right? So the radical, the radical vision for your life actually can come from your specific um, story, right? We can begin to connect, um, uh, connect movement and movement making, even in ways that we don't, uh, we may not identify ourselves as folks who are organizers or activists, right? But to be a black person in the world is a radical act, right? So what does it then mean to, um, to then connect to radical movement and radical movement making, right? And to connect um, that, uh, to your own action and your own uh, your own possibility and, uh, and and the way that you want to move in the world. I find that oftentimes people people feel like they want to do something, but they don't know where to start. Right, and we can start with um, with the ways that we actually experience these systems. And it's not just about organizing and being in this. Organizing is not just being in the street with a bullhorn. Right, organizing is the everyday of it. Um, and organizing is making sure that uh, that we are doing what we need to do and to make sure that the, the lives that we live um, are lives that are free for us and that are liberatory for us. And we do that by uh, by connecting ourselves to um, to our own agency and to the ways that we have survived and resisted and continue to to, to thrive and build. Wonderful. Daya. I think that we were told to say one word, but I, I'll just say a few. Um, this is real quick. Uh, I would say what, what I'm thinking, I'm certainly inspired by this conversation. And so I want to say, and what I want to remember too, is remember our legacy. Um, remember the work of our ancestors and that uh, we were manifested and dreamt of. Um, embrace the present, listen to Black youth, uh, mm -hmm. and support Black institutions. Beautiful. Thank you so much to all of you. I look forward to reading and looking up all the many, many pieces of knowledge you all share with us tonight. And thank you to the audience for joining us. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. And all of the 